Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Unit 3 review. We have five major styles to look at, neoclassical, romantic, the first half of the century, if you will. Then in the middle of the 1800s, we have the rise of realism, which then gives birth to Impressionism and subsequently post-Impressionism. The neoclassical style is, of course, a return to the ideal uh, styles of proportion and interest in anatomy and heroic subjects, the interest in the heroic nudes that we saw definitely in the Renaissance, but certainly the idea is to revive the ideals of Greco-Roman uh, art making. And you can certainly see that in the Oath of the Harati painting at the top right there. That painting, of course, tells the story of the three Harati brothers swearing uh, an oath to fight against the Curiati brothers uh, to determine which side will be victorious in the battle between Rome and Alba Longa. And of course, the tragedy is that the brothers on both sides have intermarried with one another's sisters. So there's no way to completely win without hurting yourself, your brother, your sister, your brothers-in-law, but it's the right thing to do morally. So that's sort of the backbone of neoclassical is that it is rather stiff, formal, all about this return to Greco-Roman style. You can see that in the George Washington statue at the bottom right. And that certainly is a reaction against the Rococo style, which was considered too frivolous, too sexual. Uh, the narratives weren't ennobling. But it is kind of frustrating because certainly if we look at it from a certain point of view, if the only good art is the art of Greece and Rome, then the Renaissance is good, the Baroque is okay, but not quite as formal, the Rococo out of control, now we're back again to the ideals of the Renaissance. It's as if the art world has one very fixed idea of what art can be, and we're gonna see that challenged throughout this unit. Uh, this is the work of Jacques-Louis David, of course, the death of Marat. Marat was one of the leaders of the French Revolution. He was a prolific writer, and he promoted the idea that the aristocracy, the wealthy who had hoarded their wealth and had harmed the poorer classes, should be held accountable, if not outright executed via guillotine. He has called for the execution of the brother of Charlotte Corday, and he has a letter in his hand from Charlotte. She's pleading with him for a meeting to try to get him to be uh, merciful, to give clemency to her brother. He refuses to do it. She's prepared for this eventuality and stabs him. You see the knife just below his elbow on the floor. You see he's still working on the goals of the revolution. He's got his writing equipment. He has her letter. You can see the stab wound and the blood there as well. Interestingly, of course, David becomes not only a, a painter who serves the revolution, but when the revolution is over, we see because of the military prowess of Napoleon, his political rise to eventually become emperor and David ends up working from directly. Ang is a follower of David, one of his pupils, who does a little bit of distortion in this piece. The back is uh, a little bit longer as if she has some extra vertebrae. The arms are two different lengths. There's no way that that thigh uh, behind the fan there could really connect to the hip in the way that it is. It's a distortion in a way similar to what Michelangelo did in the Renaissance to create this sort of ideal beauty within a very strict framework. We saw the nude in classical Greek and Roman art. That's no surprise. Here, in order to make this nude female figure more acceptable in some respects to the French audience, by setting her in an exotic location, a harem of the Far East, she is now sort of a object of curiosity. It would be shocking to a French audience member to see her as a contemporary French woman in a contemporary setting. Uh, so it is a way of allowing the to indulge in painting the beauty of the female form by placing it in this cultural other context. Some scholars have written that because of the inclusion of the elements from the Far East, the hookah, the uh, feathers, and so forth, that this is a painting that's somewhat tied to the Romantic style, but I would argue that overall those uh, smooth proportions, the way the limbs are depicted, it sort of makes her look like a marble statue. I think Ang really is better categorized overall throughout his career as a neoclassical painter. 
Clearly, that's the case of Benjamin West, who was born in what becomes America, born in Pennsylvania, ends up the second president of the Royal Academy in London. And he's known for history painting, which the academies, of course, dictated was the ideal and high form of art making, uh, was the goal of most painters to be a successful history painter, large scale, important historical events, biblical stories, mythological stories. This is clearly a historical event. It is the death of General Wolfe and a conflict between the British and the French in Quebec. We see, obviously, a recreation of the scene because West, of course, didn't witness it, and the people commissioning the piece are included in the painting. Some of them, though, were not actually there when it happened. So it is a recreation. We see the figure of the Native American toward the bottom left. He is presented in a form that's rather idealized, um, much like a Greek statue. But the notable thing about Benjamin West is that the figures are dressed not in togas, not in the clothing of ancient Greece or Rome, but in the clothing or uniforms in this case that they would have worn in their actual contemporary lives. Copley is another painter who is um, from what becomes America, but ends up living and working abroad, lives up living and working in England. This piece is a neoclassical style history painting, but it is rather remarkable in that it takes its source from an actual event from the news as opposed to uh, a battle scene, a Bible story, or um, a story from myth uh, mythology. The event actually did take place. The nude figure toward the bottom left is Watson. He was um, serving on a ship that was in Havana Harbor in Cuba. They were on shore leave. He went swimming, hence the nudity, and he was attacked by a shark. The shark actually attacked him three times. He very nearly lost his life. In this image, of course, you can see that he's lost his leg below the knee. You can even see the blood a little bit here at that lower left-hand section of the painting. You can see that there's a pyramid of action as his shipmates are uh, attempting to save him and to, to fend off the shark. And one of the shipmates is clearly of African descent. So we're starting to see more people of color included as active participants, heroes, rather than as objects of, of somewhat racist curiosity. Romanticism was a style that came about slightly later than the start of neoclassical. You could argue there are neoclassical um, examples going all the way back to the students who followed Poussin, but the romantic style is somewhat a reaction against neoclassical, and those two styles were equally um, acceptable to the salon during the early half of the 1800s. And the romantic style has nothing to do with romance novels, although there may be stories of lovers. It's usually lovers who are uh, suffering an extreme loss. One or the other is dying, or they both end up committing suicide. There are um, very few happy endings in romantic paintings. The classic romantic novel, of course, is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And you can see here that the characters in all of these scenes, for the most part, seem to be taking place in very, very, very dramatic actions. Um, there's lots of curvature, lots of S-curved movements. The figures are less stiff, less geometric than the neoclassical style. And generally, the figures are in situations where they've been pushed to absolute moral extremes. The situations are so dire, but they are still making um, decisions that will affect the not only the outcome of the historical events they're involved in, but the fate of their souls. And you see that here quite clearly in Goya's 3rd of May as these citizens stand up against the oppression of the French occupation during the Napoleonic Wars. One of the classics of the Romantic style is Jericho's Raft of the Medusa. This also depicts an actual real event. The um, ship, the Medusa, was carrying crew and passengers from France to a French colony on the coast of Africa. The ship captain who got his job via family uh, influence, not because of skill, ran the ship aground. The crew, for the most part, took the few lifeboats that were available. There were six. The remaining crew and passengers attempted to construct this raft from bits of the ship. They did try to tow it with the 
uh, lifeboats, but quickly abandoned it. 150 passengers and crew were on this raft. Only 15 of them were alive when they were rescued. You can see the ship that rescues them right on the horizon. Just this little tiny dot there is what is uh, the only depiction uh, in the distance of the ship that comes to save them. You can see another pyramid of figures being stacked here from the dead at the bottom left and foreground to the slightly more active figures to much more active to this figure frantically waving for help. You definitely see a lot more curvature in the uh, poses, in the spines, the limbs, the less stiffness, less geometric shape to the poses themselves. Um, but you also feel that these are characters who are in a desperate situation and have been pushed past the limits of normal human endurance, which in fact is what happened. There were uh, assassinations of people on the raft who were trying to mutiny against the rest of the group. They did resort to cannibalism uh, to stay alive. There were absolutely horrific um, personal tragedies taking place, and that was really the heart of what Jericho was trying to show, was the human toll, but also human survival in the face of absolute um, despair. The uh, painting was constructed in some respects through interviews that he did with the survivors. He had the raft taken apart and reassembled in his studio. He did studies of severed limbs and dead bodies to get all of the detail correct. A pretty remarkable story, which of course the French government was not thoroughly pleased with, but it did ca um, cause this attention for the need for reform um, in society, clearly. The romantic painting Death of Sardinapolis is the other really classic example of the style painter Delacroix. In this case, not an actual event. This piece was inspired by romantic poetry, an epic poem by Lord Byron about the Assyrian king Sardanapalus. His city is under attack. He will not be able to be uh, victorious. He knows he likely won't survive. So rather than go out and face the enemy in an honorable way, the king decides to have his harem slaves, his soldiers, his finest horses killed and set alight in front of him, his treasures destroyed, as if he's not going to allow the invading army to have his treasures, his most beloved objects. He's going to take them with him into death. Goya is a Spanish uh, romantic painter, and here we see the 2nd of May, in which the citizens of Madrid are rising up against the oppression of the French invading uh, soldiers during the Napoleonic War. The famous one, one to know for the test, of course, is the sequel, the 3rd of May, the next day. This actually is a real event that took place in several locations around Madrid, where the French soldiers rounded up the men of Madrid and put people to death to try to quell this uh, revolution or this uh, resistance to their occupation of Spain. Goya definitely was an artist who used the romantic style to remind us of man's inhumanity to man, people forced into these extremes of torture and murder, um, to really call our attention to the toll on the human soul and psyche of living under these kinds of conditions. You can see kind of a Christ-like reference in the pose of the main figure in terms of the arms being outstretched. And he's also the only thing that's purely white and brightly lit in that image as well. This is a German romantic painter, Caspar David Friedrich. The painting is in black and white here because the photographs that we have of it were black and white. The painting was actually destroyed. Uh, it was in a convoy of trucks trying to transport it to protect it during the Second World War, and it was unfortunately bombed. But it does give us a sense of what Friedrich is all about. He's able to create an emotional impact from the landscape itself. There are a few figures in this painting. A lot of his paintings do not have human beings at all, but they create an eerie, and a somber, disturbing emotional impact. What the French might call maison scène, the, the story that happens from the setting itself is really quite powerful here in Friedrich's romantic painting, Cloister Graveyard in the Snow. And the English romantic painter, John Constable, was known for his use of the palette knife rather than a paintbrush. And you can see that in 
this paint, if you get really close to it, you can see that the paint has a bit of impasto, a bit of uh, texture. It's thickly painted in a few places and not as much detail. When you really look at it closely, you can see that what appears to be detailed at a distance is actually just little suggestions and blobs of paint up close. Even more dramatic, even more uh, similar to what the Impressionists are able to pull off is the work of Turner, the British uh, romantic landscape genius. Turner's slave ship, it was originally titled Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and the Dying, is of course inspired by Turner's own interest in the abolitionist movement. This piece was premiered at an abolitionist conference. He took his inspiration from actual events and from uh, his abolitionist leanings as well. There had been a case of a slave ship uh, captain throwing people overboard in order to collect the insurance. That's sort of the theme of this one as well, although the ship appears to be in dire straits as a typhoon approaches. But you can see hands, feet, shackles as living people are drowning. You can see sea creatures massing here on the figures that appear to be the dead bodies. The Hudson River School is an American romantic landscape group of painters. School in this case not meaning a place where you would take art classes or get an art education. Think rather of the way we use the term school of fish or school of thought. It's a group of like-minded individuals. So the Hudson River School painters painted in and around New York's Hudson River Valley. Their leader was Thomas Cole. You see some of his painting cycles here. The Course of Empire is this one on the left. In the middle, straight down, is the voyage of life and another of the members of the group here painted an homage to the leader of the style to thomas cole in this painting kindred spirits which also features the famous poet william colin bryant so the styles of neoclassical and romantic are kind of in um, conflict with one another throughout the first half of the 1800s and there are other issues at play as well including the industrial revolution so as things increasingly are being made by machines things are becoming more automated more factory jobs some people are very much in favor of this uh, move toward technology and automation, and others are opposed. William Morris is opposed. He is the founder of the arts and crafts movement. He formed a design firm called the William Morris Company to specifically make handmade goods for the home, and they were, of course, preserving traditional craft techniques in so doing. One of the things that he did that was really quite smart was to create items of different price points. So there were simpler chairs that were at a lower price than some of the more elaborate ones. Likewise, all of the goods they made for the home could be found at those different price levels. You could think of it in some aspects as the way some people tend to resist certain aspects of technology. If you have friends who don't like texting or having a cell phone, they are technophobic, maybe they don't like to use the internet. Um, that's sort of similar to the attitude of the arts and crafts movement, but it goes a little further. The arts and crafts designers really believed that we were losing something of our heritage if we gave up these uh, traditional crafts in favor of machine-made goods. There's a movement painting that parallels what the arts and crafts uh, designers were doing, and that's the pre-Raphaelite movement. They literally were looking to the past as their inspiration, much like the designers were looking at past techniques, these painters are looking at art of the past, and they believe that with Raphael and the art that was made from his time period forward, that that work was really bad, that it was overly idealized, that it was too perfect, it didn't look natural, it didn't look like what they arguably thought the real world should look like. So they called themselves pre-Raphaelite because they wanted to return to the way art was made before Raphael, pre-Raphael, right? So when you look at these paintings, you get a sense of the approach of early Renaissance as opposed to the absolutely perfect idealized high Renaissance of Raphael, of the exaggerations of the Mannerist movement, or certainly any of the trappings of the dark and ponderous Baroque or the overly sexualized Rococo. It is a little bit of a throwback to an earlier day. Here we have the 
Crystal Palace, which was built to house the Great Exhibition of 1851 in London. The designer is Joseph Paxton, who was known for his designs for greenhouses. The building is made of cast iron. Uh, cast iron construction was a hallmark of the Industrial Revolution early on. Pieces could be mass produced in a factory situation and then shipped to the location where they would be used. We call this prefabrication, making ahead of time, prefabricate. So they were able to create the Crystal Palace itself to house massive World's Fair exhibition of the works of industry of nations all over the world. At the bottom right, you can see the Colt repeating pistol was one of many exhibitions that came from America to this site in London. The building itself had over eight miles worth of display surface, if you measured it all together, covered 18 acres, about 100 feet in height at its center. The building was built right on top of the site where living trees were. They didn't tear the trees down, they just built around them, the trees lived. Um, the building could not have been built in a traditional way. It's very much a product of the Industrial Revolution itself. The cast iron is going to eventually get replaced with steel, but at this point, that prefabricated iron is really critical to the speed with which this building can be built, just a matter of months as opposed to decades. The daguerreotype is our first example of photographic technology of the Industrial Revolution. The daguerreotype uh, is so named because it was invented by uh, Louis Jacquemin Daguerre. The technology itself sort of existed prior to uh, his invention in that we knew of the camera obscura, a box with a small opening, light passing through it would create a reflection on the back wall of the box upside down of whatever was on the outside of that surface. You can see that in the top right. The problem was that you couldn't make the image permanent. So Daguerre developed a technique of using a sheet of metal, usually tin, that was covered in a solution that had silver in it. And as the light came through the opening in his camera obscura, it would cause the silver to oxidize. So places would go black, light gray, and black. So you can see some of his photographs there on the right. The problem with the daguerreotype is you only get one exposure, one image on the metal itself. So this invention or advancement of technology is the glass plate technology in which the same type of silver solution is used, but the plate instead is a sheet of glass, which creates a negative. And that negative then can be used to print multiple duplications of the photograph onto photographic paper. This is the technology that was used by the uh, photographers who recorded the events of the Civil War in America. You see Timothy O'Sullivan's photograph at the top right. The daguerreotype required a very long exposure. The glass plate required a somewhat shorter exposure time, but still things had to be relatively still or they would blur. And you can see that in Timothy O'Sullivan's photograph of soldiers here in the river. You can see the figure here and here are blurry and transparent, almost like gum, because they were moving, whereas the other figures remained still during the photograph. The style realism really takes off in the middle of the century, around 1850. The big star of this movement is Gustave Courbet, who in fact gave the movement its name, realism with a capital R as a proper noun. I try to avoid just things as realistic because it's hard to tell if you're saying realistic with a capital R referring to the art of the realist movement of the 1850s or if you're just trying to imply that things look like the real world. So I usually try to substitute the term naturalistic, things that look like nature, look like the real world. In this case, you're looking at artists who very much painted what they really see, and they refused to uh, imaginative uh, additions to the, the scenes that they were painting. They didn't want to paint scenes of mythology. In fact, uh, Courbet was known for saying that he couldn't paint an angel until he could see one. Not that he denied they exist, existed, but he wasn't going to make up what they looked like. He could only paint from direct observation. In point of fact, the so official salon, the academy system, was open to artists who were doing neoclassical style or romantic style. 
but when the realists submitted work, quite often their work was rejected, and that happened to Courbet. So he set up his work in a separate uh, exhibition space. Paris had a World's Fair, sort of an answer to the Great Exhibition of 1851. In 1855, the Paris Exposition Universale was held, and Courbet submitted work for judgment, and it was rejected. He was not allowed to show in the official exhibition. So he set up a separate, what he called, pavilion of realism and showed 40 of his works there and inspired a real change in art making from that moment forward. You can see the subjects in realist paintings quite often are rather humble. Daily life, people working, and we've seen this before to an extent. A handful of examples in Northern Renaissance, a few examples um, in French painting in the Renaissance and into the Baroque. Um, very few images like this in the Rococo. The majority that we did see that really truly are genre paintings of real life were in the Baroque in Holland. So there's a connection there. The work of Millet, the painter that you see here, is very much reflective of his humble beginnings. He was from a relatively poor family in a rural environment, and the people of his village got together the money that was needed to pay his tuition to go to art school. He kind of honors them in his paintings of the nobility of work in a rural environment. These were very much an inspiration to Vincent van Gogh, who quite frequently repainted scenes or characters from Millet paintings in his own style. Courbet, again, is the leader of the style. This is his painting, The Stonebreakers, which was shown in the official salon, but people were very critical of it, confused by it. It's on the scale of a history painting, but it doesn't show a significant historical event, nor a Bible story, nor a mythological story. It's just people breaking stone into gravel to build a road. They're not quote unquote important. It's one of those uh, moments in art history where we really begin to see artists trying to break the rules of what art has always been about or what the art uh, world said was acceptable to include subjects that reflect the real world the rest of us live in and the way we really live. Courbet again said that I cannot paint an angel because I've never seen one, but I also like this quote, it is necessary to be of one's time. He didn't make the art of the past, he wanted to make the art of now. And that painting that you see here is the burial probably of one of his family members in his hometown of Orna. The burial at Orna was a piece that was absolutely rejected, rejected for the Exhibition Universal. And even though we saw works included by Ang, the neoclassical painter, by Delacroix, the uh, romantic painter, the, the art of Courbet was rejected from, from this uh, world's fair, so to speak, from this exhibition. And so he set up his own separate pavilion of realism in answer to that moment. Daumier could be described as not just a realist, but a social realist. His work often depicts the inequalities of wealth between upper and lower class, and you see that in the third class carriage. He's also known for his lithographs. Now, a lithograph is a print made from limestone. No carving is done, but here you see a lithographic stone being prepared, smoothed, and the old image removed from it completely. Then a new image is drawn on it with crayon that has a grease base. And strangely, anything greasy will start to eat away at the surface of the limestone on a microscopic level, leaving a reservoir that will um, be attractive to oil-based ink. So the limestone is kept wet with a sponge, oil-based ink is rolled across it, the water prevents the ink from going in the white areas, but the area that had been drawn um, where the grease crayon used to be attracts the oil-based ink. So you can create prints that look like charcoal drawings, pen and ink, ink wash, all kinds of techniques can be replicated with lithography. And the image at the top is one of Daumier's social realist statements that he made as a lithographic print. There had been um, an incident in a low-income housing uh, apartment in Paris in which somebody fired a gun, the police arrived and rather than uh, interviewing people or trying to find out what 
the cause of the incident was or who was responsible, tried to put down any sense of outra um, outrage or, or upset by simply firing into the building and randomly killing uh, innocent people who had nothing to do with the initial shooting to begin with. So it was a shameful moment. The British, rather uh, French uh, police, French government were not um, thrilled when the print came to light, and so they actually confiscated the prints and destroyed the block. Rosa Benour is a female realist painter from France. She's a really remarkable character. She was not, as a woman, was not allowed to draw and paint from the nude model, so she turned to studying the anatomy of animals because you can see the muscle structure and bone structure because they don't wear clothing, of course. Uh, in order to gain access to places where animals were, places like the horse fair or uh, slaughter yards or farms, uh, in the type of clothing that women were sort of required to wear in this era, um, bulky skirts and heavy, very, very long dresses, Rosa Bonheur literally had to get permission from her doctor and from the local police. She had to carry a permission slip officially signed by both of them uh, in order to have the right to wear pants legally. Women were not allowed to do so. Rosa Bonheur was also a lesbian. She had um, publicly known long-term relationships. Her first wife passed away. Her second companion was slightly younger than her, was an American painter. Uh, Rosa Bonheur also kept animals um, as pets. She had a variety of very exotic animals. She won the uh, Legion of Honor for her work, and Queen Victoria of England was so enamored with her work that she asked for a private viewing of this piece, The Horse Fair. Winslow Homer's an American realist. This is a painting he did after the Civil War, which kind of gives us a childlike sort of hope uh, going forward. But Homer was also known for his work during the Civil War as uh, an illustrator who, because the camera couldn't capture things in action uh, with the wet plate technology that was available at the time, people created illustrations of things that were moving really quickly, and then those were made into engravings and printed in magazines and newspapers. This is Thomas Eakins, the most important of the American realists. It's a portrait of a doctor, Dr. Gross, hence the title, The Gross Clinic. It has sort of a caravesque sense of light, cellar lighting streaming in from the upper left, illuminating the doctor and the patient here. We see the patient is under anesthesia, his femurs being operated on here. You can see the blood, you can see the scalpel and other surgical tools. And here you see the mother, the only person reacting in an emotional way, the mother of the patient. The doctor calmly explains what's going on. His secretary here records what's happening so they can publish an article about it later. And in the background, you see all of these figures are the medical students of uh, Jefferson Medical College who are observing and learning from this uh, character, this uh, leading doctor. So this is a portrait in a very American style. It is very realist. It looks exactly like what he looked like, but it also shows the man doing in the painting what he did in life. It shows what made him famous. And that's, again, rather similar to the Dutch Baroque. We saw that with the uh, anatomy lesson of Dr. Tull. Rembrandt. Another painting that harkens back to some earlier work is by an American expatriate. That doesn't mean he hates America. That means he's living and working abroad. This is John Singer Sargent. He was living and working in uh, France. He had friends there who were also American expatriates. They had uh, an enormous amount of wealth. Their family had uh, made their money on trade with China and other um, overseas uh, locations. You can see some of the vases that they imported here in their home. This portrait is of their daughters, and it's staged in such a way that it's less a group portrait sitting on a couch looking forward as it is a chance for the artist to paint these large negative spaces, increasingly dark areas of shadow. The figures are in um, really non-formal portrait poses. They look as if the girls are kind of hanging out, playing together in the entryway to their parents' uh, Paris apartment. This is by Henry Osawa Tan, 
most famous African-American painter at this moment. He was the first truly internationally known famous African-American painter, bar none. He was the son of a minister and a former uh, slave, but he grew up in uh, relative wealth, upper middle class, uh, far from the southern plantations. He didn't really know directly the impact poverty on former slaves until he traveled to North Carolina, which is where he made sketches and photographs of this grandfather and grandson. Notice the grandfather is in shadow, the son grandson is in light as if he's the future. Uh, definitely Tanner is an important painter for us to know, especially when we factor in that in order to have the level of success that he had, although he trained with Thomas Eakins in Pennsylvania, he really had to go to Europe to be treated as an artist rather than as a black male who was able to paint, which is somewhat how he felt he was being treated in the United States. The Barbizon School is a school of realist painting. It is definitely not a school where you would get training, take classes, again, school of fish, school of thought, group of like-minded people. The inspiration for the Barbizon School comes from the painter Corot. You see his painting on the left. He was referred to as Per Corot, or Father Corot, by his followers. They kind of treated him like a family elder, but also like uh, a religious leader. He advocated painting en plein air, which means painting in the open air, painting on site from direct observation. This was only possible because of the invention of paint in tubes. That may not like a big deal, but artists up until this point, roughly the late 1830s, early 1840s, had to make their own paints. They had to grind the pigments, mix the medium and the oil together with the pigments. The paints were stored sometimes in glass jars. Bulky, heavy, breakable, not easy to transport. So artists were not accustomed to being able to paint directly out in nature, especially if it was a far distance from their studios. So that Corot did, and that's what the members of the Barbizon School did. They specifically moved to Barbizon outside of Paris, and they painted there these beautiful landscapes on plein air, in the open air, from direct observation before the Impressionists began to do the same things. So they kind of set the stage for what the Impressionists will do. One of the major realist painters who inspires the Impressionists is Manet, M-A-N-E-T. Manet submitted work to the official Salon in 1863. He submitted this painting on the left, which is known as Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, in English, the luncheon on the grass, and the painting was rejected, as were thousands of other paintings at this time. Uh, the public were confused, the artists were outraged, and the academy was sort of forced at the suggestion of Napoleon III, was uh, kind of forced to hold an exhibition so people could understand why these were been rejected, what was so terrible about them. They didn't meet the standards of the academy or the, of the salon system. Generally speaking, artists were less interested now in doing history painting and doing things in a neoclassical style or trying to imitate what the way art had always been made. So this piece really was kind of a slap in the face to the establishment because there's a nude female with clothed males in temporary clothing in a contemporary setting. She's not a goddess of ancient Greece or Rome. They are not set in the past. It's not set in some exotic harem in the Far East. This is in a park just outside of Paris. She's looking right at us and she's not ashamed. It was shocking to people. The interesting thing is, of course, we've seen images of clothed men in an outdoor setting with nude females near them in the work of Titian and Giorgione, who uh, created images like the Pearl Concert in which men were composing a love song and nude figures of the muses, the goddesses of inspiration, appeared to them. We could see them, the men in the painting maybe couldn't. But what Mene is saying is that we're being hypocritical by 
saying that we can only look at the nude in a classical context. Why can't we admire a nude body of a female in a contemporary scenario? So it definitely was a painting that provoked people, particularly because the main composition, the main three characters are modeled directly after a painting by Raphael, a painting that happens to be of three men who are all river gods, uh, but again, mythological characters. You see the inclusion of still life items, you see the um, strange distortions in terms of space. If you look directly behind the figure with the cap, you see a rowboat here at the shore. If you follow that shoreline along, suddenly this female figure in the water seems far too large in scale for the space that she's in. These are intentional changes that uh, Manet is making. It's a painting that's meant to kind of provoke a uh, response. The Café Chabot is important for us because that's where May would meet with his followers, the Impressionists quite frequently went to this particular cafe. That was their uh, hangout. It was their safe space, if you will, for discussing their new ideas of this radical avant-garde approach to art making. They usually met on Thursdays and Sundays weekly during uh, Manet's lifetime. Monet, with an O, is the true leader of the Impressionist movement. Now, to help you remember the difference, this is silly, but it works. Manet with an A. You can remember him because this thing is a picnic. You might have a sandwich, and you might put mayonnaise on that sandwich at a picnic. So Manet with an A. Monet with an O, if you remember the sun in Impression Sunrise, is a circle like the letter O in the name Monet. I know that's cheesy, but it will help. Monet is the person who gives the movement its name in the title that he gives this painting. He called it Impression Sunrise, hence the whole movement took its name from that moment. The idea is that we're not really painting direct detail like the way a camera can. Now, because of camera in some ways, the artist is liberated to paint in new and different ways. So Monet's focus is on the effect of light on color in the natural world and in the observable effect of light reflecting from surface to surface, reflecting color from the water, for instance, into the sky. You can see him using very short brushwork, but very evident brush strokes. You can clearly see what the brush is doing. The paint looks like it was applied very, very quickly in short, small daubs uh, of paint. Monet is the leader of um, the Impressionist group in general. The Impressionists actually only showed together officially eight times over the course of about 12 years, and not all of the Impressionists were in every one of those shows. But the group was a little fluid. People would join and leave. Uh, but Monet was sort of the de facto leader of people who painted in this looser style. Another group coalesced around the painter Degas, and we'll look at him in a bit. Renoir is in the Monet group, definitely painting with loose, open brushstrokes. Here in his painting, Dancing at the Moulin de la Galette, we see people in an outdoor cabaret dance situation, drinking and enjoying one another's company, and the light is painted in kind of short, uh, dappled daubs of paint across that surface. We know that Renoir very often painted people he really knew in the leisure activities that they could take part in, partially thanks to the Industrial Revolution. Bette Morisot was one of the two uh, women in the main part of the Impressionist group. Uh, this is her painting, Villa at the Seaside. I know that Bette Morisot and the other famous woman in the group, Mary Cassatt, supported some of the exhibitions through the family money that they had inherited. Pissarro is the only artist of the Impressionist group to show in all eight of the exhibitions. And just like the other members, particularly Monet, Pizarro painted the same subject from multiple points of view at different times of day and different times of year under different lighting effects. Many of the Impressionist and post-Impressionist painters did the same. Degas is the leader of the second Impressionist group, which is a little bit tighter in execution and uses a little bit more detail. In this image, you can also see the influence of the Japanese prints that were being collected in Europe at this time. You can see there's a lot of floor plane showing. We don't have a lot of the back wall, really, relative to how much of the floor we see. And it seems as if we're looking down on the situation from a slightly higher or elevated vantage point. They're drinking absinthe which is a vocab term for us. Absinthe is this greenish liquid 
liquid here in front of this figure. The absinthe is, of course, an alcohol, but it has a hallucinogenic effect. And here we're seeing kind of a commentary on the negative effect that would be witnessed by people who are watching other people take absinthe. She may be enjoying herself in her own mind, but you can see the effect on her body is rather harsh. Mary Cassatt is the only American in the official group of the French Impressionists, one of the only women, and certainly the only American. She came from family money, but her father was rather strict about her having to prove that it was making a profit for him to continue to provide some income for her, which she did. She was also concerned with um, supporting the exhibitions of the Impressionist work financially. She also strove to encourage the other members of the group to explore printmaking as a way of making money rather quickly by making lower cost repeatable images using dry point and aquatone. The dry point is the technique she's best known for. Dry point is sort of like an engraving technique. You take a needle-like tool, scratch into the surface of metal plate, usually copper, and the scratch is what holds the ink. The line is rather soft, kind of looks like a pencil mark on rough paper because the mark that you make with the needle raises a little bit of metal to the side of the cut called the burr, so the mark wavers a little bit. We also here see some dry points with aqua tint. That's what looks like the watercolor that's colored these images. You can see prints here from uh, Cassatt's attempt to encourage Degas to explore printmaking. These are his uh, etchings and aquatents to create these images. They're actually images of her as a model. These are examples of the prints that were being collected from Japan. Uh, Japan had been closed to trade with the West, with Europe, for a number of years. It became possible in the 1850s, and suddenly people were really collecting these uh, artworks and noticing the use of large areas of negative space, high horizon lines showing a fair amount of ground plane, a uh, little uh, less amount of sky, which you can certainly see here in this woodcut print at the lower right that was copied as a painting by none other than Vincent van Gogh. Whistler is an American expatriate living and working in London. He is an Impressionist painter as well. And this painting of his, uh, Nocturne in Black Gold, Falling Rocket, is a piece that's rather notorious. It's a painting of the effect of reflections of light and smoke on water as fireworks are being shot off. It's quite beautiful, really, if you know what the subject is. It makes perfect sense. But the most influential art critic of the day, John Ruskin, was very critical of this piece, wrote a scathing review of it in which he said that not only was Whistler uh, poorly trained uh, and not very talented, but that his uh, painting was nothing flinging paint around. And so Whistler sued the art critic for libel, which is intentionally publishing written statements that are meant to harm someone's career, and Whistler actually won that libel case. Paul Cezanne is our first example of a post-impressionist painter, post just meaning after. So with this style, you very often see artists using still evident brushwork, but often larger patches of color. With Cezanne, you see very square, large, uh, bold shapes of color. He's still doing direct observation, painting en plein air, painting in series. He did multiple paintings of this mountain, Mount saint And you can see, just like with Mourne painting, reflections of color in the sky also reflected in the ground. Surat called his technique of post-impressionism divisionism. He was interested in how light divides in a prism. That's part of the inspiration behind the way he painted, which was to juxtapose different colored dots side by side and allowing the mixing of the color to happen in your eye at a distance. We call the technique Pointillism, initially he called it divisionism. This is the work of Gauguin, probably the second most important painter of the uh, post-impressionist movement other than Van Gogh. And in fact, Gauguin has a pretty notorious life story. He did not start out to be a painter. He 
worked in a brokerage firm. When he decided to be a painter, he basically packed his wife and kids up, sent them back to live with her parents, never let them again. Eventually traveled as far away as Tahiti and settled permanently there, had multiple illegitimate children. His paintings more often than not are drawn from imagination rather than direct observation, and they use an intense amount of emotional color. That you can clearly see here in this painting of women having religious experience after hearing a sermon. They actually see in front of them Jacob wrestling the angel. This is the work of Corey Fred Vincent Van Gogh. Van Gogh is known to us through the letters that he wrote back and forth to his brother, Theo, who financially supported him. Van Gogh was not terribly successful in jobs or in romantic relationships. Um, he was considered a very poor drawer in the few attempts he made at getting official artistic training. He always struggled with the drawing part, especially drawing people. Uh, in his uh, career, though, really what he became best known for and beloved for was this intense use of color and presenting the world from his particular unique point of view. You can see the paint is applied very, very thickly in this painting. Uh, that heavy use of paint, of course, we call impasto. Toulouse-Lautrec is another of the post-impressionist painters. He does use pretty evident brushstroke, but much, much larger flat areas of color. This image is another Moulin. This is Moulin Rouge. The translation of the name is the Red Windmill, and that was one of the architectural features of this particular cabaret, dance hall, bar. Uh, it was a place where people met who were sort of counter culture. So even though they're dressed in suits, you have to imagine them as kind of rebellious, uh, avant-garde characters. We know that Toulouse-Lautrec advertised the entertainments of Moulin Rouge in lithographic prints or posters. You can see a poster at the top right, and again, the reference to the technique of lithography at the lower right. Another movement that is very much inspired by Paul Gauguin's emotional approach to color is the Nabi Brotherhood. They are a group of post-impressionist painters. They took their name from the Hebrew word for prophet, and they believed very much that what they were doing was not just replicating the real world the way it looks, not just making a direct observation of the world, but rather providing a bridge between observing nature and including symbolic emotional symbols uh, from their own imagination. Though so the Nabi Brotherhood tended to paint in a way that was very consciously, intentionally abstract. The floor plane doesn't conform to perspective rules. The figure in this one is foreshortened in a very odd pose. And you're very much aware of the fact that this is a painting and not an attempt to create a believable, realistic illusion. Lots of pattern and lots of usually bright colors in Bonnard's work. Vuillard's colors can sometimes be a little more dull, more earthy. But here you see the pattern contrast between the dress the wallpaper. Uh, the wallpaper itself seems to change on the back of the door. It's darker as that door's in shadow. Behind the window, uh, glass in the window pane, the pattern changes to a little bit lighter. We see a third pattern out the window of the blooming flowers on the tree just outside the window there. The impressionist style of, uh, post-impressionist style rather, of symbolism is exemplified here in the work of Gustave Moreau. Moreau and the other symbolists did tend to draw and paint from imagination. They also quite frequently would rely on storytelling uh, of mythological stories and literary stories. This is a story about uh, a human being who has a love affair with Jupiter or Zeus, when his wife finds out about it, she forces him to appear in front of his lover as his real self, and that overpowers her. She can't look at the god, so she dies. But their son, hers and Zeus's, or Jupiter's, is god Bacchus. Redan shows us kind of a sexual tension in this painting as well, and this kind of ugly male cyclops figure contrasting with the female figure in the foreground. But again, the space is not typically believable. The painting is more about the dreamlike quality and the symbolic meaning of the story than it is about visual accuracy. Certainly that's the case with Edvard Munch. You knew this painting before you took the course. The cry or the scream almost uses 
a meme of a smiley face, or in this case, screaming face, that you could read into as almost anyone, male, female, almost any gender, race, or age, as a stand-in, an avatar, a soul that represents how we feel when we're having extremes of emotion. Like in this case, I truly believe a panic attack is taking place. Albert Pingham Ryder is an American symbolist, and his work very often is um, also somewhat religious in nature or does use a religious symbol in addition to the mythological symbols he's known for. In this case, you have death on a pale horse, you've got the Grim Reaper, but you also have the serpent that represents, of course, sin and Satan. Here we've got the work of Rodin. This is the Burgers of Calais. As we move into sculpture and texture, three dimensions, it's hard to classify this work as uh, in terms of the styles that we've looked at, in some respects, he's doing a great job of showing accurate anatomy, which might make you think he should be a neoclassical painter. There's a heavy emotional story uh, of sacrifice, which might make it romantic. But if you really look closely, you can see there are distortions in the proportions. There are areas that are kind of abstracted in these forms. Post-impressionism is really the best category, I think, that we can run that in. His work here shows us the city leaders, the burghers of a city of Calais, which is a French city on the uh, coast uh, along the English Channel. They've been besieged during the Hundred Years' War uh, in the late Middle Ages, um, besieged by the English, and the city is going to fall. There's no way that they can escape or, or defeat the British. So the British strike a bargain that if the city elders will appear bareheaded, barefooted, and carrying the keys of the city, you can see the keys right here, if they are willing to humble themselves, then the city itself will be spared. The men, of course, expect that they will be killed by the French uh, or sorry, by the English invaders. Ironically, the Queen of England decided to intervene. She felt that killing these volunteers would be a bad omen. She was pregnant at the time, and so she interceded with her husband to prevent the outright uh, murder of these men. But again, in the context of the story, they don't know that they will be spared. So you see people resigned, kind of pointing to heaven, encouraging one another, feeling defeated, absolute despair, resignation. You can see different emotions in each body. But that also brings us to true abstraction in sculpture with this piece, Walking Man, which is constructed from two different uh, original sources. He had worked on legs in wax for one figure, changed them and moved on to a different piece, worked on a torso for a second, later combined those two pieces together. So it intentionally lacks the finish of the arms and the head, concentrating on that striding forward motion, the most important part of walking, I suppose, would be the legs and feet. It gives a sense of pure abstraction and movement without extraneous detail, pretty similar to the way that the post-impressionists were painting as well. Camille Bell is the former student, studio assistant, and lover of Rodin. There is a big age difference between the two of them. She became pregnant by him at one point, had an abortion. They ended their romantic relationship, but by this point, her father had died, and her brother and mother were reluctant to support her financially, uh, so she was dependent on Rodin for the rest of her uh, life until the point at which she started to exhibit emotional distress, um, at which point her brother and mother conspired to have her uh, committed to an insane asylum. Even when the doctors tried to proclaim her to be mentally healthy, the family would not allow her to be released. She spent the last 30 years of her life in confinement in an insane asylum. This piece is about the death of an older member of a family, maybe a father, perhaps uh, an uncle, and being grieved for by a younger female member. But you could also see, even though he's being carried off by an angel of death, it sort of symbolizes the re love relationship gone wrong between Claudel and Rodin himself. We also look at architecture a bit in this unit, and we're looking now at the beginnings of true modern architecture. This is the beginnings of uh, skyscraper building in the United States, and that's made possible by the transition from cast iron 
to steel frame. Now, steel is lighter, but also stronger than cast iron, allowing people to build taller. So Louis Sullivan divides this building visually into three zones. The ground level and the second floor are decorated in one particular, a clearly drawing emphasis of your eye to the main entrances. Then these arrangements of the brickwork and the decoration on the main section of the height of the building arranged in vertical lines to draw your eye upward to the finish of the building at the top, sort of reminiscent to the base shaft and capital of the Ionic Corinthian columns in the Ionic and Corinthian orders. As buildings become taller than this, the use of this kind of three-part style will start to fade away, but you get a sense of the intense decoration if you look at these detail shots, you can really see how beautiful this work actually is and how it clearly tells you how the building should be used. That's part of Sullivan's design philosophy. He said, form should follow function. Form is how the thing looks. Function is how it's used. So the looks should follow come after we've considered the function. Think about how it will be used and then design toward that purpose. Our last big topic was photography. So here we see the use of glass plate uh, photography moving closer and closer to the time that we'll have actual uh, celluloid film. This is the work of Jacob Reese. He did these photographs specifically to record actual contemporary events for the purpose of reporting. So he considered himself to be a photojournalist first and foremost. And what you're seeing on the left is his photograph of the uh, bodyguard, so to speak, guarding the entrance to an organized crime boss's crime den. Pretty remarkable work there. Edward Moybridge is also a famous photographer from this era. He's known for taking photographs in rapid sequence to show objects in motion, whether that be uh, animals or human beings. So uh, one of the famous stories about him is that he created this series of photographs of the horse in order to solve a debate as to whether a horse had to have one foot on the ground at all times. You can see clearly the case. But when you see those uh, photographs in sequence, it looks a lot like a strip of movie film. And you know that if you see still images that are just slightly different one to the other in rapid succession, like in a flip book, or in stop motion animation, if you see it at the right speed, about 30 images a second, it will seem as if the image is moving. And Moybridge invented a technique or a device to create that effect. He called it the zoopraxiscope. And you can see a circle there with images of a horse running. When spun and viewed through the lens, you would swear that you were seeing true motion picture. So that's really the um, beginnings of the invention of the motion picture camera. So that's everything you need to know for the test for unit three. Good luck. I know you can do this. Um, we're going to get through this together. I know this is a difficult situation for everybody. I so appreciate your effort all the way through, and I hope the videos are helping you to study. Best of luck, my friends.